seminario este semestre de seminario física y cómputo. También, bueno, estamos celebrando el séptimo aniversario de, de es un seminario que, pues, ha, hemos traído, tratado de llevar alumnos y profesores de la facultad pues, temas, a veces de física, a veces de otro, eh, otras cosas. ¿no? Eh, entonces, eh, para celebrarlo, pues, y como llegaba un invitado, el cual eh, colaborado, el doctor Patrick Vega de la Universidad de Exmarfeng, él nos va a hablar sobre uno de los temas, él trabaja en flujos físicos y flotación. ¿no? Eh, bueno, ahora voy a decirlo en, en inglés para presentarlo. Eh, this is the last seminar in the semester. And, eh, for this seminar, the, Dr. Patrice Legal will speak about the, uh, some research about the, the, the lenticular vortex in the, for instance, the, the the spot of Jupiter and also the medis in the Mediterranean. Okay. Thank you for the count. The last is last year. I have to confess I'm a bit nervous because I worked this morning on my talk and everything was fine at 9 o'clock and at 11.30 everything is good. <laughs> and, and the PowerPoint didn't work with that as well. So, I yes. Of course, you know it is. You want to have a little, little color of air and on so on. You want it to get better, and the better sometimes is better. But hopefully, we have a copy on this computer, and I have also a copy on my on my there is a small memory board there on the computer with uh, with the uh, So uh, so this talk is about as I said, I would like also to thank you for for uh, this invitation because also for me to come. This is already four or five years that I visit I visit Nan and uh, I would like also to, to thank you for this, uh, this collaboration we have here. And uh, so just to present my, my work on this uh, on this uh, um, just to start, this was a 90 of uh, Phil Marcus that I met in one of his APS meetings some years ago. And Phil is a uh, professor of fluid mechanics in uh, Berkeley University. And uh, he asked me if it was possible to introduce the red spot of Jupiter and the laboratory. Oh, okay, I thought it was a bit of a crazy idea, but yes, yes, we can do some things. And so back to France in my, in my uh, laboratory. So the name of my, my laboratory is IAFE. This is the Institute of Research of Phenomena out of equilibrium. Okay, so we do uh, two mechanics, but also some biophysics and uh, granular effects. <coughs> and so I am a researcher at CDRS, and I work at the laboratory, the laboratory of Exmouth University. So we, I, I, I went back to my, to my lab, and I proposed to Mikhail Lebas, who is one of my younger colleagues in, in my lab, to hire a PhD student, the name is Orian Bover, and, uh, and uh, we performed some experiments with that. And at the same time, Phil was computing some numerics with his own PhD student, and his name is Pedro Hassan uh, Zahe. And now uh, Pedro is an assistant professor, I don't remember exactly where he was in the States. And the subject crossed back the Atlantic Ocean again. <laughs> to finish in Guadalajara University, where <clears throat> Anne Cross is a professor there, and Anne is a former PhD student of myself, but that 20 years ago, okay, after she married a Mexican engineer, and uh, she met a girl out there in Guadalajara, and uh, they have, uh, she is working with uh, Raul Cruz, who is a uh, Someone working in aerodynamics and also in oceanography. And uh, they hired a master student, Hector de la Rosa. And Hector also made some work on, on this particular hypothesis. And now we got a PhD grant from CONACID for Hector to, to stay in Marseille uh, under my supervision on another subject. So this is a great question of. Who knows who, I and mean, we are a big family, and uh, it's, it's very nice to make yourself like 
everybody, everybody, we have to meet, we have to speak, we have to exchange ideas, and we have to, to visit the world everywhere. Okay? And so this is really the spirit of my visit here and, and uh, of this talk. So coming back to Jupiter, I'm not an expert of Jupiter. Okay? Phil was an expert, he is an expert. And uh, just to show you some images from the NASA of this uh, dread red spot. So this dread red spot is a very big anti cyclone in Jupiter, on the surface that we see on the surface of Jupiter. And uh, Phil made some uh, PID analysis using the clouds on the, on the, in the vortex. Okay. So using the clouds, you can track them and, and uh, you do a PID analysis and you have a map of the velocity in this big, uh, big eddy. So this big eddy is 25,000 kilometers wide, like that. Something like a little bit more than 10,000 kilometers in the latitude direction here. So in fact, the Earth will go there. Okay? So it's as big as the Earth. So it's crazy, crazy anti cyclone And the velocity, you cannot really read the, the, the numbers there, are in fact, they are in 79, that was the Voyager spacecraft mission. They were about 100 meters per second. Okay, so these are also very intense. Very intense. Right. And this red spot, in fact, was well, known from a long time ago, and we attributed this discovery to uh, Hook or uh, Cassini, where we made some uh, photo, not photo, in the 60s, something, but pictures of what they saw uh, on Jupiter. Let us remark too that 90% of the vortices, we say large vortices in Jupiter, 90% of them are anticyclonic. This is a remark that I made. This is an illustration that was done in 18 something, I think it's 1870. And uh, it was reproduced in a paper by Hand in 61 where they think at the time that the red spot might be what we call now a Taylor color. That is, you will know, and I will show you in the next slide how it works, or both do not know the Taylor color, but you can imagine that what we see is this thing, and the vortex can go down to the, we don't know if there is a floor, you know, we don't know what, it, what really what, how is constituted in the Is it a thick atmosphere or a narrow atmosphere? We still don't know that. And the Juno mission, which is out there now, will, will be some light on this scale. But there are two possibilities, in fact, what this, this vortices is like that. And this idea, in fact, so is, lies on what is called the tail column. And the tail column is a very simple phenomenon. Imagine you take an Aristotle's equation. You say, I want a stationary solution, so T of T equals zero. You neglect the non linear term, V right V is neglected, and you neglect two of this cross term. So the only thing that is left is the balance between the primary source, 2 omega across capacity, and the gradient of pressure. And if you do that, you see because omega cross U has no component of the vertical direction, that DP is easy. And if dp dz equals zero, after taking the curl of this equation again, we can prove that all the derivatives along z, all the field is equal to zero. That means that if you rotate the field strong enough, nothing can, no gradient in the rotating direction. Yes. And there is a famous experiment that was done by G.I. Taylor himself, where he took a basin of water and he rotated this basin of water. You take a little object in the bottom of the basin, and there are two ways, two ways to do the solute, the, the, the field, and you can do it with your students. It's a great experiment to do. Two ways to do it. Or you change a little bit the rotation rate of the flow, or you move a little bit, and I think this is the technique that the children use. There is a, you put a thread on this little object there, and you, and you, pull, the little, and you pull the little object across the field. And what you see, in fact, is this kind of photo, this kind of um, columns, that we call the tail of columns. And these columns are, are very special. You see, as the flow cannot go over the object because the d over dt equals zero constraint. So when you have a, some, when the flow wants to, to, 
turn around this object, he has to turn on the horizontal plane. Okay? And this is, in fact, what happens if you put a die filament, and you want the die filament to go across there, and it's not possible. Okay? The, uh, the filament will just turn around this color. So it, it acts as it, as it was a kind of solid color in the, in, in the tool. Okay, so you, you see at the time, in the 60s, people said, okay, you see something, but might be the tail of color. I mean, just maybe there is a mountain at the bottom, at the bottom if there is a ground on Jupiter or something, and maybe we just see the top of this tail of color. And uh, in, per, in the 80s, one photo disappeared there, that's not important. What I wanted to say is that in, in the 80s, uh, people reproduced what uh, this, this kind of atmosphere, or this kind of climate we have on different, different planets. And uh, one of the specialists of that is Peter Reed, and this is a photo that we have. So imagine you take Jupiter or any planet and you look at this planet from the South Pole. So here you have a region, so it is, very, it is a flat planet. Okay. You squeeze the planet. Here you have the whole South Pole, here you have the hot equator. So an easy way to do that, to reproduce this thing, is to take a basin, in the middle you cool down the water, at the external part you heat up this water, and everything rotates. And when you do that, I try to start with the thing, you see that indeed you can reproduce this growth of vortices. This is called the baroclinic instability. And this robot vortices in some conditions, and this movie, I don't know, yes, maybe this movie will show that. In some conditions, you are left with only one single vortex. So this is very, very kind of red spot of Jupiter. Okay? It's a kind of column because it goes to the bottom. And later on, that was in the 86, in the Soviet Union in 86, and people made a kind of similar experiment, but instead of using a baroclinic instability, they use a, a shear flow instability. So they had a parabolic basin like that here, and this basin, so this is solid matter here, this basin has two rings, oh, sorry, one ring, which is in blue here, in the wall, and this ring can rotate versus the basin, and everything rotates. And you put a a shallow layer of water there, you see that's the second thing here, and you see that here there will be a shear, so vortices can be generated in, in water. And this is a photo from the top, and they have also, as in the barotonic tank, they have several vortices, and in some range of parameters, only a single vortex can, can stay and remain in the flow. And here is the history of the number of vortices they have in, in time. Just one vortex. So this is fine. It seems it's possible if you use different kinds of instabilities in rotating systems that only a single vortex can survive forever or for at least a long time. That was the experiment that was not done, and in fact, it was inspired directly by Philip Marcus. That was done in, uh, not far from here in uh, Austin, in the laboratory of Paris Linet, with Joe and Samaria. He was a postdoc, he's a friend of session now, he was a postdoc with the uh, team. Uh, and there, they use another technique to, to generate the shear. It, they, have, they have a rotating torus, field of water, and they have sources and sinks, a source and sink at the bottom of the tank. So you have this kind of radial motion, and when you, when you rotate, the radial motion, because of omega cross u, we make a force which is azimutal, and so you make an azimutal flow at the bottom. If you make an azimutal flow localized at the bottom, you can shear it, you have an instability which is the same kind, in fact, as the one used by the people, I don't remember the name of people in, in Russia, but generated in another way. And they observe the same kind of stuff. Okay? They observe that they have also, in certain, certain circumstances, they have a strong and this time was cyclonic. I, re I read the paper again, they said that this vortex was cyclonic, it was not anti-cyclonic. And that was confirmed by Phil, in fact. It was very hard for them to generate a strong, unique anti-cyclonic. Nobody knows what you want. So, 
uh, through this experiment, so where we are. What is fine is that we can have, as I said before, a single vortex which is selected by the pattern, by the flow. It is stable and it is long lived. But it is easy to have a long, long lived vortex if it is sustained by instability. Okay? If you put heat or shear, you can sustain vortices. Okay? And uh, we, see, we saw also that it was possible, not always, but in many cases, to have anti cyclonic eddies. And this, one of these big eddies can eat they eat the others and remains alone in the floor. What was not really fine, in fact, is that these vortices are called barotropic vortices. And as I said before, g over dz equals zero, so this is the definition of the barotropization of the, of the, <coughs> the flow. Okay? Nothing happens in the situation. But, in fact, if you take the atmosphere of Jupiter, and the little dots there are the data that I took from handbooks that we can find on Jupiter. So this is, in fact, the pressure on Jupiter. So the pressure is it's a real, it's a real gas or a perfect gas with a proportional to density. Okay. Like in the atmosphere, that is very heavy down, down. The pressure is high when you go down, and very low pressure, very low density when you go high. So it's a stratosphere. So, is it possible that the vortex <coughs> can be sustained in a stratified atmosphere? And that was exactly the question that Phil Marcus, who knew the results from Srinay and the others, he knew that they had barotropic vortices, and he was very embarrassed at that. Is it possible to have a barotropic vortex in a stratified atmosphere? If you look this up a little bit more carefully, this, this uh, stratification of the atmosphere of Jupiter, you can fit these this data points by uh, exponential rule. And I found myself 27 kilometers. And what you can find in the literature for specialists of Jupiter is 23. So, okay, that's, that's the, certainly something like that is the right number. And when you read things about the greatest spot, it's very difficult to know how deep it is. Because the only thing you see is the top layer. But they can do a little bit of chemistry with the color of the clouds. And even this morning, I checked the last paper, there are still people in chemistry, chemists. They are still fighting to know what is this color and what is this product that can give this color and so on, under which pressure and so on. But apparently, <coughs> the, the red spot should be some like 50 kilometers, maybe 25, maybe 15. But in any case, it has to be <coughs> constrained in the vertical direction. <coughs> this is very small, 50 kilometers, compared to the 10,000 or 25,000 kilometers. So that's why we call these vortices pancake or lenses vortices, because they are very flat. So I will not explain that. So this is an experiment you can find on, on the web. My colleague, uh, Michael and Lovas and the student, they, they went to visit um, uh, UCA. And uh, they had this kind of, um, they made some kind of uh, student applications of these flows. So this is a, just a rotating flow. So you have to take a, you know, it is a, a little thing to play the record. How do you call that? Uh, to the disk? Uh, you, you, see what I'm, you know what I mean? Thank you. Turntable. Turntable. Turn okay. So it's a turntable, and uh, you put a you put a cylindrical basin of it, and this is plain water, and you put some dye, so you make a perturbation. This perturbation, the dye will expand. You make a tail of column as I explained before. Okay. So when you rotate, you want to be barotropic. Okay. Now only stratification. So now in this experiment. The only thing we got is salt water there, and less and less and less and less and less salt pure water here. And when you put dye there, and the dye at a certain density, it will, of course, remain in a flat layer, trying to expand, okay, just because of the gravity force acting upon it. So now it's very easy to imagine that if you rotate the stratified flow, 
you have a tendency because of rotation to be elongated and you want also to extend. Okay. And so this is what's going to happen. You have a kind of this flat vortex. We say we stay there at a, at a given density, given certification. So that, that was just fun experiment for students, just demonstration experiment. And uh, what we did after that, uh, before that, then in Marseille, was to set up a rotating table. So this is, and I think, uh, I think you're going to understand even if it is in French. Uh, so we have a tank, which is a rectangular tank. This is 50 centimeter or 70 centimeter, 50 here, 50 here. And we have a kind of very small pipe here. We have a pump with a reservoir, and so we can pump in to, to produce something. What else? We have a screen here with, with uh, dots, and we will use what is called the synthetic shearer method to, to, to record the perturbation in the density. Okay, so cameras, lasers, kind of easy experiment. And so this is a photo of this experiment here. Soil stratification, I can explain, but not maybe not now how you can get it. And there is a technique called a double bucket technique, which is quite easy to set up. And, and, and you can have a, a nice stratification. So usually you put pure stuff, very salty water at the bottom, pure water at the top, and you manage to have this kind of, kind of linear stratification between. And the vortices will be in this area there, and, uh, and, they, and they, they can survive there at least. So these are experiments, so from the top and from the side. So you see we have a, a little part there that will push. We do the same thing at the first experiment as so. We push inside some water with dye in it and also small particles. See, as you push the water, it's because of the density it would like to expand. As it expands, of course, the coilless force will act and will make it rotate. Okay, so we have a double thing. The stratification will play a role with the density and also rotation will produce. <coughs> and you end up with this vortex. But this vortex is at the center? Yes. We put it at the center, and this is uh, something we are thinking of. Uh, sometimes, just to make it short, when you don't, you, in the theory, omega cross u can be anywhere on the table, except that we have a centrifugal force. And, that, and the iso density are not really flat, they are a little bit curved like that. Mm -hmm. okay? so, and, but the rotation is still vertical. Mm -hmm. So there is a small angle. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is called in material or in an earth science, the beta effect. So what is the effect of the beta effect? It's something we have never Okay, so this is a PIV version of that. So PIV, you have little particles, you have a camera, and you see all the particles will move it will go, and you can extract from this PIV, you extract the velocity field. So you see that in the middle of the vortex, you have something which is minus omega vortex times r, not r, and a very small uh, radial velocity in the back of the mm -hmm. And with that, we can construct our what is called the Rossby number. And the Rossby number is the frequency of the vortex divided by the frequency of the table. But there is a factor of two of the frequency of the table because of the two and the mm -hmm. So it is omega vortex divided <coughs> by f equal to omega. Okay, a little bit of equation. Do you think it's very easy and uh, on it's, it's a very nice subject. I, I like this subject because we can, with very easy arguments, we can understand. <laughs> so, we write down the equation of the motion on, uh, on the radial direction. So, it, this is the radial equation which are being analyzed. And uh, so, dpdr is equal to what? This is equal to the Coriolis force here. And uh, if I said that u theta is equal to omega r, so this is a solid body rotation vortex, if you want, I have this expression here. So dpdr proportional to r. dpdz, dpdc is just the hydrostatic balance. So is equal to minus j 
room rotation <coughs> is just radiation versus the ambient flow. And so we define this as an N square, N being something that we call the room vassalier frequency, which is characteristic in the change in density. Okay? So this N is equal to minus N square rho zero z. Just a question that we call the N square, this is a zero dz. One of the rho zero dz. So this is the adversity balance. So you see that, oh, this is very easy to integrate. You have, you have take this one, dp dz proportional to z, dp dr proportional to r. You can find easily by integration, but p is uh, as a shape of uh, different p values are ellipses under this form there. And you can measure the aspect ratio of these ellipses. So you can measure, so this is a combination of as uh, the ratio between this term and this term is like and then there's a way to, to do it to say <laughs> what is the dpdr this is dp delta p divided by n for example what is dpda delta p divided by h so this l there should be there it is omega 0 f omega l and you see omega 0 n squared multiplied by h and with that so you can calculate Alpha, which is equal to the ratio of h divided by L, and you find that alpha, the aspect ratio of the vortex, is simply f divided by n squared, so rotation, stratification, squared, times rows which is the vorticity of the vortex. Yes, the so the, the height, the uh, z equals zero when the density of this fluid yeah. is the same as the oh, yeah. salt. Yeah, yeah. So this is our theoretical prediction. Okay? And we saw that we can have this kind of elliptic vortices. We saw them in that So we try to see if it works. Before we want to do that, just a number very small, two different modifications of the theory. The first one is we add to the Coriolis term, we add one non-linear term, which is the centrifugal force. Yes. You see, B theta squared divided by R. This is just the centrifugal, uh, centrifugal force. And also, we can take into account the internal stratification of the vortex. Imagine the vortex itself is a little bit heavier at the bottom, denser at the bottom. So there is a stratification inside the vortex, a stratification outside. So NC, for example, NC is the stratification itself. And the theta here is a uh, rotation. So you transform a little bit this, the expression we saw before. Ross B will become one, Ross B times 1 plus Ross B. Ross B squared is exactly the centrifugal term and you can do the mass. And instead of N squared, we have NC inside the vortex, minus N squared minus N squared outside the vortex. So this is just a very easy extension of our theory. But from this extension of the theory, we see that for anti-cyclones, so Ross being negative, okay, in general, absolute value of Ross B, of Ross B is less than one. That means that the table rotates faster than the vortex. Okay? Fast rotating kind of, fast rotating table. This is usually done in experiments. But because Ross B is negative, anti cyclones, I must have nc squared minus n squared negative. And that means that anti cyclones must have a stratification less than the external stratification. On the opposite, cyclones, Ross B positive. So this has to be the opposite sign, has to be positive. <coughs> Stratification inside the cycle should be larger than stratification outside. And we will use that So here are the experiments. So we measure the uh, Rossby number. These are examples of the measurement of the Rossby number. So the Rossby number is there. So this is a Rossby number is the frequency of the vortex divided by the frequency of the table. Of course, it will decrease like that. And in fact, at the beginning of the experiment, it decreases very fast. Of course, because there is uh, what is called the geostrophic regime to, uh, to reach. Okay? 
you have all this turbulence, you send waves, these internal waves in the, in the stratified area. So at the beginning it is very abrupt and you have a strong stratification. But as soon as the geostrophic uh, and hydrostatic balance is reached, the equation that we saw, they play together. Okay? If I want to extend, okay, I, if, if I want to extend because of uh, gravity, of my, my, my own density, I have to rotate. Okay? And we work on make a round, round circle of people on these equations. And you can sustain the vortex. Much more for you see here thousands of rotation of the table, thousands of period of rotation of the table. Okay. Also, we can also make two knot pictures for different f over n. So that we keep this is I think alpha. And alpha at the beginning is a very elongated vortex, and here it's a very flat vortex. So we, have, we would like to put everything in the, in the same diagram, but before, this is just to show that we can measure very easily the, the shape of the vortex. So I, re I recall that we have the pressure under an ellipsoidal phase. And uh, you, you see, be, 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 because we put down the vortex, this is the white line there. So we, at time t equals zero, time t equals zero is not the real time t equals zero. It is the time t where we decide ourselves that we are in equilibrium now. Vortex has not turbulence inside and so on. And so we, we say this is t equals zero, and this is the first shape of the vortex. It was nearly circular here, and we let it go. And as the Rossby number will increase, okay, the aspect ratio will change. So in red, it is a prediction because of this equation, okay, where the Rossby number is a free parameter. Okay. At each time, we have a Rossby number, and the Rossby number gives an aspect ratio. And if you want more, more about, if you want to conserve the volume of the vortex, you are constrained. So this is a prediction of the theory compared to the experiment. And this is also, so this one is the same. And this one is another one where we didn't stop injecting uh, water in the vortex. Okay? So it's a continuous formation of the vortex. So the vortex will swallow it. Its volume will be bigger and bigger, but it can correct this effect. And, oops, and this is the prediction. And the uh, prediction in blue and the observations are in black. OK, so it seems that our very simple balance between rotation and uh, stratification gravity works fine. And in fact, we presented these results in a conference. And we met a, an oceanographer. And this oceanographer said, huh, this looks like what people call medis. So maybe you can localize here Spain, here, and Africa is here. And in fact, this brown, this, this is a numerical simulation done by people from Yves uh, from, uh, Romer in France. And their names are there. And these brown things there are vortices. From time to time, vortices are emitted at just in Portugal, just at the, at the horn of Portugal here. And the water inside these vortices are, is Mediterranean water, which is trapped okay, in a vortex and is floating inside, I would say, the oceanographic of the Atlantic Ocean. So these medis, as they call them, are very flat. So there is a description here. So the water from the Mediterranean Sea will flow down on the, on the sea floor and will detach or make a vortex like that. And this is quite important because you can imagine you have all the bio stuff inside the sea or the salinity or pollution and anything is transported. And this, they can last for four years in the ocean. These measures. And uh, this is a, a true measurement of, uh, I think it was the density here, of the, of the vortex here. And they know also that, and they can measure them when they do these uh, campaigns in the sea, they can measure the engine stratification and the different characteristics of the medias. Okay? They know that the number is equal 
roughly 0.3, and the uh, bad velocity is about uh, 10 centimeters per second, and so on. And uh, they know also that they have an internal stratification. And you find all this data when you look inside publications from oceanography. So the idea is, oh, maybe everything can collapse together okay, from the lab to the medleys onto the gravel spot. Okay. And this is the, the final curve. Okay, the final curve of this study. This is the, so we read we cast the thing a little bit. Here is alpha and we multiply by this m square minus m c square here divided by f. Here it is the Rosby number, which is here. You can take into account the one plus Rosby that that's very small in fact. Our experiments are here. The blue are all kinds of symbols there. Are the three vortices, no, 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 are the fourth vortices, continuous injected vortices. These are the open symbols there. These are here the, the experiments on the, the vortices, the first one, the vortices that will finally disappear after one or two hours. Here, you know the crosses there, the different crosses correspond to different medias, in fact. So we are really on the, on the theory that we made. Here, here, this is the medium. And the greatest spot is here. And this is the oval beam, which is another uh, Jovian vortex also. This is another one. But we, we have some data on it. So you see that we, we, we really predict, with this very simple theory, the shape of these uh, lenses can be in the lab, which are very flat, small Reynolds number, to medias, where Reynolds number is already very big, and even to, to Jupiter, where we have this uh, red spot. Okay, these are the data. This is a photo of our experiment. Have, have you checked the time? Oh, okay. It's okay? And, uh, 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 yes, so this is Orian, my student, former student Orian, and uh, a rotating table, and uh, you see the, you see this, uh, the, the vortex inside the rotating table. Okay. This is a movie that you call, that you can find on the internet, it's called maybe you know it, Perpetual Ocean, and it has a nice music that I can give you. And this is a combination of measurement by satellites and numerical simulations. And you see the fact that the ocean, and I discovered that with this movie, not only made it, but everywhere there are thousands of these vortices everywhere in the world. Okay. We pay attention to these, to these eddies there, which are called the eddies of the North Brazilian current. Okay, but you see that everywhere we have, the, we have these, these uh, big eddies. Most of them are on the surface of the, on the surface of the ocean. So we can look at the different currents and these different uh, eddies. So this that was a, a movie. And uh, you can just uh, just say that uh, it was uh, so it was done by a, a joint project between MIT and, and GPL. And I don't know the names of the authors. They, they, they are not we didn't sign that. But they said here that they present this movie to a competition, and it was not awarded. So I think this was very very nice for them because uh, I think it's a great movie. Yes. Nice for them to say, we lost, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I will skip this part to go to the experiments, but just to say that, of course, we did, that was what was the numerical simulation for the anticyclones from the Berkeley group, and they spent also some time doing cyclones, okay, in numerics. So, in fact, to do cyclones, you remember that cyclones need to have a stratification which has to be larger than the outside stratification. So how can we do that? You have a stratified flow, but a little piece of water there has a stronger stratification. This is very not, not easy to do. In numerics, you can do it because they choose the initial condition. But in experiments, it, it's, it's a bit more difficult to do. So to do it, and that was done in numerics, but also in the experiments, is to put a pipe in the stratified layer and to suck out a little, little amount of water. When
when you do that, you see that the isopycnol when the push closer one to the other. Okay? Where at the, at the plate when you suck out the water. And when you do that, in fact, you increase the stratification. Mm. And it is what we did. So I, I would skip this these graphs which are not really mine in fact. But you see that this is a stratification, these are the numerics, okay? This is a stratification as a function of C, and you see that with different uh, conditions. You have here a uh, kind of step which show that stratification is in fact, is in fact greater. Okay? Because you have this density at a certain level, this density at a certain level, and you see that the, when you suck the water between, the greater will be larger. Okay? So stratification will be stronger. Okay, so we did that in the lab. So this is an experiment. That was done in fact in Berkeley, where I stayed for, for uh, some weeks. And this is PIV, reverse colors. And you see that I suck out the stratified water here around. You see that it rotates very fast here. And uh, you have this is a PIV map. And from the PIV map, you do exactly the same story as before. And what we observed is that we measure the density with a technique which is called the fluctuation of the density, with a technique called the Sheeran technique, synthetic Sheeran technique. And in fact, these are what we measure. This is the D rho of the DZ, we can measure that. We can measure the D rho of the DR, the red rho gradient. And this does not correspond to the very simple map that we have for anti-cyclones. The cyclones we were able to create were a bit more complicated. And to fit this rho, we had to need a more complex expression, okay, where you have this kind of exponential kind of a Gaussian function of the radius, Gaussian function also of the vertical, and you have even a correction, polynomial correction for that. And this expression, in fact, is sometimes used by people from the scenography. This is where we have decided to get this, this uh, crazy expression. And now we have one, two, three, four, and the be number four parameters to adjust to see if it can correspond to, 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 to what we have in the experiment. So this is the fit of the parameter P. So the P, or this is the profile of the density, and uh, this is the zero dz, and at uh, r equals zero in the, in the, in the vertical, yeah. And uh, we see that this is what is predicted, and these are our experimental points, so you find the B coefficient, which is the curvature of the thing. And after you can reduce what is the K, and you can reduce what is the R, and you can reduce what is the L. Okay, and just to prove that we are, this is not so crazy, this is what we did in the experiment, this is the measurement, and this, well, this is the zero prime dz, the zero prime dz here too, and at uh, different time. And uh, this is uh, what the fit we give. This is not a numerical simulation, it's just a fit of the expression we had before, okay. this uh, modified Gaussian vortex coming from a standard graph. And you see that it is, we, we, can, we can say that this is satisfied. There's always some kind of bump in the middle. Yeah, because maybe, maybe, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> maybe there is a, a part, I don't know whether there is a part there, or something. you know, this is experimental. Right, there is something there that is neglected. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we plot, this is the same curve as before, but this time for cyclone, mm -hmm. you see that we are the same, the same kind of thing that is respected. <coughs> okay, that was done, so more um, in, in numerics, and only a single experiment, in fact, on, on cyclones. And uh, just to say something about the super certification that I said it before. If, ima imagine that a stratified flow, like the atmosphere. If you have a storm somewhere, you imagine that turbulence, you will mix up air or same <coughs> okay? So this is very easy, in fact, to destratify a medium. Okay? You just mix up. Now if you want to, strat to super stratify something, you, you really have to put the two the other triangles closer one to the other. And this is very much difficult to do. And this is what we believe is the main reason why, particularly in Jupiter, we have much more anti-cyclones than cyclones. Mm -hmm. Because cyclones, if 
we want to have cyclones to be super stratification. And there is nobody in the ocean or in the atmosphere with a pipe, you know, <laughs> sucking out the air or the water just to make a cycle. So this is a point I wanted to say. This explains also why this, there is this broken symmetry between the both things. Apart from also different secondary instability that can appear and which are also different. Okay? And I, I will, uh, I will uh, finish my, my talk so with this, uh, this study we made in Guadalajara. So remember I told you the IV started in Berkeley, we made the experiments in France, in Dorset, and I had I come back to Mexico because I like Mexico. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, so I worked with these guys here and we decided because of this perpetual ocean movie that I, that I saw, we decided to see what about these floating vortices. So in the center are a bit easier to make, right? It's a bilayer, so you have a imagine a salt layer that we take. You take a syringe of pure water, you, you just push water on the surface, what's going to happen? And in fact, you do the same thing. Okay? Pure water would float, would like to extend on the top surface. As it extends, it spreads away, it rotates, or made an anticyclone the same thing, the same way. So, and it is exactly, not exactly what happens in the ocean, but uh, it is exactly what they observe. Okay? On the surface of the ocean, there are indeed many vortices. And my colleague Raoul Cruz from Guadalajara was made a study of one of these particular vortex. So this is the one there. So this is the Brazilian, or maybe Brazilian, or this Brazilian coast here. And these vortices, these vortices, in fact, are, big, are moving towards north. And this is also interesting for Mexican people. Sometimes these big vortices, so they are born about the Amazon mouth. See? The Amazon is nearby the equator. And you have a current arriving there. You can see a movie there. And the, the North Brazilian, Brazilian current will go to the north. We make these broad vortices. And sometimes these vortices can enter the Caribbean Sea. Right? We have a dive. Uh, you really did not escape. So, this is one of my projects, or long time project. I would like also to, to see when these vortices can enter the Caribbean Sea. And, of course, there are many allusions coming from the Amazon. So, is there an impact on the biosystem in the, in the Mexican Gulf? Is there also an impact on the number of fish? Is there an impact of the price of the fish? So this, I, mean, I really think if there is someone in economy here who would like to help me to do that, I, I, I really would like to do that, you know, to see is there, is there an impact of these vortices on our everyday life? This is the meaning of economics. So, that, this is a dream. I really would like to do that, it's still a dream. And so this is a vortex, and they are two kind of data. They are satellite data where they measure the surface level of the ocean. Okay? And in red, it is because there is a dam. <coughs> so an anticyclone is a dam. As small it as can be a dam, because as it has light water, it can float above the sea. Okay? So it is here. And <coughs> the, measure that, the, the point there are the data that they really measure on the ocean. So this is one of the kilometers. Yes, it is 225 here. 225. And the elevation, I can tell you, is 20, cent 20 centimeters. Okay. On 200 kilometers, they have a 220 centimeters elevation in the center of this anti Okay, So this is also, so we have this kind of measurement with satellites. And they have also two ways that are left and that rotates, and this way can permit to calculate the Rossby number. Okay. So what I propose to his colleagues is in fact, so to do this, you take pure, you take salt water in blue here, we add fresh water, which is the one in yellow, pink in color here, and this is a warm anti-cycle. Okay. 
okay? It does the shape. You have also cyclones, why not? You have cold cyclones. So cold cyclones, you know, it's like a boat. You have heavy water here, and you have light water here. But heavy water has not a band, but it has a And so there is less, less volume here. But this thing is not stable, in fact, because you have heavy water locally, it's not stable. Locally, it's not stable you have heavy water above uh, light water. So this is not possible. But this one is very possible, and it can calculate the solution of that. And the solution of that is not even here, but <coughs> yes, it is even here. You see, this is the CR. So CR is the top surface. Expression you can get from just hydrostatic. This is the CR, this is the CR, and eta R is the shape at the bottom. It is given by that. Okay? So the first question in fact I had is is it the same result that I will obtain if I do my theory? Okay, the theory that I presented before for continuously stratified And it is exactly what we have. And we will also do the experiment. So the experiment is as I said before, you take you take salted water here, blue, you have in dark blue here, the both are coming from fresh water plus dark here. You have a pureta, what do you see that? That's French. Pureta here. And, uh, and we look with camera lasers and we, we make the study as before and PIB data and so on. And so these are the, some uh, uh, photos from these uh, vortices in green. So you see that as time is passing by, the vortex was like that, and it's flat and flat and flat and flat and flat and flat. And, flat. and uh, during this flattening, we would like to know if this aspect ratio, respect the aspect ratio coming from the equilibrium equation, hydrostatic plus geotropic. So this is the variation of H, the depth, and I think the uh, Radius was maybe before. Radius. So radius will be up. No, radius is there. H is there. And PI measurement at the top. 2 millimeters per surface. <coughs> and here we see, the, we see the velocity profile as usual. There is a center which is not far to be a solid body vortex. Okay. But we have also to say that we have eggs. Pay attention to that. This is a PID map of that. So this is a Rosby number, as we said, it decreases very slowly. In fact, these vortices just to be honest, are small, <coughs> are a little bit unstable, but the eigenvalue are very small. In fact, this kind of study was already done by Paul Lindan. This is a photo by Paul Lindan in H1. We made vortices like that, floating vortices <coughs> on water. And we observe that in a certain area of parameters, you can have instability that breaks these vortices. And our vortices are here. They should be unstable, but very slightly unstable. Okay? And if we measure here, you see, uh, if you measure the horizontal aspect ratio, yeah, that is the shape of the ellipse, you see that it started around one, and finally, after time, it will go maybe to two. So it will be slightly on the left and not the perfect circle. But that, that's not gravity. So we put together the, the data that they used at the time, the, the, the theory that they used at the time. And they, you remember I gave the expression for the C, C and the eta as a function of R. And you can calculate from these expressions, you can calculate the aspect ratio. And you can recast indeed this aspect ratio exactly in the, in the same shape as before, which is here. Rob B1 plus Rob B x squared divided by n squared. But what is very strange is you have to define what is n, so this, uh, this uh, frequency due to stratification. And there is a length that appears, which is equal to h divided by 8. And I still do not know what is the meaning of that. H divided by H has a certain, certain, certain role there in the physics of these vortices. But except that we cannot understand that, 
we, we see that the, the, we can define the isolate the same way as we did before. More than that, I think I will, I will add money to the end. Uh, if, you, if you calculate, if you say that the volume of this vortex is conserved, as it is, uh, as it is a parabolic, paraboloid, okay, cylindrical parabolic, h r squared is conserved. So this is a new constraint. And if you take this constraint r squared with this line, you can prove that r, the radius, has to move, has to move <coughs> to the power minus 1 over 6 of this term there. h has to be as this term and the power of 1 third. And we plus that for the five experiments, we made five experiments, and you see this is the experimental data. We are not very far from the stop one third. We are not very far here from the stop minus one six. And now if you we plot alpha square and the function of the parameter, wow. Seems that the general scaling works, but we are very far away, very far away from our prediction. Our vortices are really too flat. Some, we are missing something. Something is wrong in our theory if we want to compare to this simple theory. So to correct that, we realize in fact that these vortices were fitted by parabolic shape. But in fact, you see that means the vortex does not have a true parabolic shape. It is more like a Gaussian shape. Okay? And this, this is a fit with a Gaussian shape. And that works really better. So can we do that? Yes, we can do that. Because vortices, which are Gaussian vortices, exist. And we know their formula, they are given there, uh, studied by different people. So we take the uh, rotation of the curl of the field to be under this shape. So V theta will be V theta as immutable velocity with that. This is a comparison between the blue is experiment and green is velocity. Okay. Well, this is the vorticity, sorry, here. And the, parameter, the new parameter L, you see if you do R equal L, this term is equal to zero, so L is the point where the vorticity is equal to zero. So in fact, these vortices are shelving vortices. Anticyclonic in the middle, cyclonic, the rate of cyclonic vorticity in the ground. And if you do that, Right. You can integrate the equation the same way we did before with the <coughs> formula, but now it's Gaussian function, so it's quite easy to quite easy to integrate. And you end up with a new expression for alpha square, <coughs> which is the same as before, but it has a term which is x squared and this term one minus exponential is a vector epsilon. Okay? So when the vortex is not in solid body rotation. But if we say it is a Gaussian vortex, we have an extra term that appears from the equation in the, in the prediction. And we, if we correct, yes, the vortices, you can interpret them as a addition. Okay, so I think you know, it's maybe time to, time to finish. I have several transparencies. I don't know if you want to stop there or go on to annoy you. Just to say that, well, the very last one. Just to say that we we try to, to put on the same graph the vortices that we can find on the description of these vortices, the floating vortices. The same thing with the same thing we did with the medias, but with floating vortices. And we study 30 vortices, floating vortices from different places in the world. North Brazil and Korean, but also some African Korean and so on. <coughs> you see that. The theory is there okay, with solid body. Okay. Some of them are not very far away, but some of them are really, really very far away. They are really deeper than what it is expected. Okay. And this is still an open question. But last week I met uh, there was some researcher working in Andersfield and he said that maybe the beta effect can affect this kind of equilibrium we have in rotating or stratified flows. So we have in fact to look the different vortices from where on the planet they are. And indeed you can see, I just said that this morning, 
that the f is very different to 10 minus 5 radian per second, which is the rotation of the Earth, multiplied by the sine of the latitude. Okay? And so indeed, you go from 2 to 15. So we're not, this is an idea, uh, a clue to, uh, to correct this uh, post-anographic data and to put them in the same, in the same field. And I will thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I've been so long. Mm -hmm.